I'm titling this message today, How to Take Your Mountain. And I'll explain a little bit more in just a minute. I love climbing. I love hiking. And uh, if you've been around here at all, then you know I've, I've hiked down and out of the Grand Canyon three times. I've been up Pikes Peak and down eight times and up Mount Kilimanjaro. And I, so I love the adventure. I love the struggle. I love the challenge. I love all of that. And, uh, and I was thinking back as the many times I've climbed Pikes Peak, I've done it with a lot of different people and some do it with ease. And some struggle a lot. I'm not naming any names. I'm not calling anybody out. But in life, each of us has a mountain to climb. We're climbing a mountain. This is a spiritual mountain that we're on. And we who are Christians, we face obstacles. Maybe the obstacle is what your mountain represents. But with God's strength, we can overcome every one of these mountains, no matter how difficult they are. Now, as we start to look in Joshua chapter 14, We've been through Joshua bringing the children of Israel across the Jordan River into the promised land. We've, we've covered them taking the city of Jericho and dealing with the stolen things and then the city of Ai and that battle and making a treaty with Gibeonites and the Gibeonites now uh, needing Joshua to come and fight for them. Now we get to this place where they're in the, the land of promise. They're in Canaan. They're in the promised land. And now... They're going to divide the land between the 12 tribes of Israel. So they're getting ready to divide the land. So each one is kind of making almost an appeal for the land that they want. And that's what Caleb does. Uh, so let's look at it. So I'm, I'm really talking about how to fulfill your goal, how to accomplish your goal, how to achieve your dream. That's what your mountain should represent. Joshua chapter 14, verse number six. It says, now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land, and I brought him back a report according to my convictions. Remember, Caleb and Joshua were the two spies out of the 12 that went into the promised land. They came back with a positive report saying, yes, there are giants in the land, but we can take this land. We can do it. The 10 other spies said, giants are too big. We don't want to mess with them. Don't do it. So there was contradiction in the reports. Caleb had a positive report according to his conviction. He said, but my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you followed the Lord God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years. Caleb is 85 years old now. And he said, he's kept me alive for these 45 years since the time he said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness so here I am today, 85 years old. Now, being an old man myself, I can appreciate Caleb's attitude. So there's three simple lessons that I see here about that, that we need to be able to take our own mountain. So I don't know what your mountain is. I don't know what you're going for in life. I mean, we have the spiritual goal of being what God wants us to be, making it to heaven. But there are other goals that we're trying to accomplish here in this life as well. And I don't know what it is that God wants you to accomplish, but every one of us have a specific assignment. And if you're sitting here right now and you're wondering, well, I don't really know what my assignment is. I don't know if I really have an assignment. Listen, if, you, if you're breathing, then you've got an assignment. If you woke up this morning with breath in your lungs, God still has something for you to do. You're not here just wasting space, taking up time. Every one of us have a spiritual purpose for being on this planet. When that purpose is done, God takes us home. So you're alive. You got a purpose. Look at somebody and say, you got a purpose. So let's get ready to climb that mountain. All right, here's the first lesson that I see on how to take the mountain. Number one, you've got to keep your confidence. Caleb, his confidence never wavered. He never gave in to uh, being a victim, uh, having a victim mentality. See, sometimes as we're growing old, older, I, I think that we feel like the window of opportunity is closing 
on us achieving whatever the next step is. It could be even as young as you're in high school, okay? I got to finish high school. I got to get this done, you know, before I, I quit, <laughs> you know, or, or you graduate high school. Now, I, I got to get into college, and I got to get that done. I got to finish college now, and then once you finish college, okay, now I need to get that job. I need to nail that job and get my career started. And, and maybe you feel the pressure of a window closing for this opportunity. And then maybe now I got to get married. Uh, and hopefully you get the job before you get married. But w- now you feel that window closing on getting married. And then once you get married, now it's okay. Now we st- got to start making a family. And now, uh, that could be early. It could be late. Doesn't matter. But at some point, the window for starting a family starts closing. And then, you know, when you start having those kids and they start growing up, then the window's closing. Hurry up and getting them out before they become permanent fixtures in your house forever. You know, so the window is closing. And then you feel, okay, man, my career is coming to an end. It's time for me to start considering retirement. And we start thinking about what life looks then. So there's always these uh, phases in our life where we, we feel like life is changing and maybe the window is closing. Well, here's Caleb and the difference between the 40-year-old Caleb and the 85-year-old Caleb has not changed. He's not fading out and he's not at 85 years old saying, you know, well, now I had my time. I had my moment. I think, I think I'll just take it easy now and I'll just coast off into the sunset. No, no, he's still holding on to a promise that he had when he was 40 years of age and he's 85 now saying, I can still take that mountain. I can appreciate that. I love that attitude about Caleb. Caleb, his faith was not shaken through all the circumstances that he went through. Now think about it. Caleb was with Joshua and Moses as they wandered for 40 years. During those 40 years, he could have gotten very frustrated. He could have given up. He could have let go of the dream, but he didn't. He held on to the dream. He kept his confidence. So what do you do when you're facing a mountain, but you don't really have the confidence to take that mountain anymore? Maybe you've kind of lost the zeal. Maybe you've lost the ump that it takes to climb that mountain. You know what you need to do? Link arms with somebody who has the confidence. Stand beside somebody who has the faith. Let me tell you my story that illustrates this. Starla and I were pastoring in Houston. And... We were doing inner city ministry on the weekends, on Friday nights, and came a time where we really wanted to plant a church out of our church into the downtown area of Houston. So I had a guy on our staff, his name was Eugene, and Eugene wanted to pastor that campus. So we, uh, we planted, we sent people down, we planted that church in downtown area of Houston, and they were meeting in this little rented facility. Uh, the facility, the, the owner decided he didn't want to lease it anymore and told us when the lease is up. Uh, I'm not leasing anymore. So we were scrambling, trying to find another place to meet. At that same time, Pastor Tommy Barnett, who pastored Phoenix First Assembly in Phoenix for many, many years, his son Luke pastors it now, they had planted his other son, Matthew, at the LA Dream Center in Los Angeles. And they were having their very first inner city pastors conference out in LA. So Eugene and I went. We were there at the conference and Pastor Tommy is raising an offering to buy the Angeles Hospital there in Los Angeles where now they've been there for 20 years or more now. And, uh, but they, had, they didn't own it this time. So he's raising money for it. And, and remember, uh, I'm just kind of an overseer of the downtown church at this time. And I'm with Pastor Eugene. And uh, I know that the lease is getting ready to be up on this building that we're in, and we're, we're struggling trying to find another building. But here we are in Los Angeles at the Inner City Conference, and Pastor Tommy Barnett, one of my heroes, I mean, I, he, I would do almost anything that he said. He starts taking up an offering for the Angeles uh, Hospital, and Eugene looks over at me and says, let's give all our money to the Dream Center. I said, yeah, I don't know about that. That's, that sounds real great, but we have a building that we need to find, and so we're going to need that money. I said, why don't, why, don't we just, why don't we just give a good offering? Let's get a good offering. 
He says, no, nah, let's, let's give it all. It wasn't, it wasn't a huge, huge amount, but it was, it was many thousand dollars. And it was, pretty, it was all we had in the downtown church account, and it was everything that we needed to be able to be like, you know, put a first and last month's rent down on another facility. And I'm just thinking ahead, thinking kind of the business side of this. And, and he's saying, let's just give it all. And I said, no, nah, let's just give some. No, nah, let's give it all. We're going back and forth with each other right now. And I'm just thinking, oh, man, I don't really want to, you know, wound his faith. He's just a young guy in the Lord. And so I said, all right. And here's your pastor, man of faith and power. I thought, I'm going to put this all back on him. So I said, and I didn't even realize what I was saying at that time, but I said, you know what, Eugene, you really want to give all that? I said, I'll ride your faith. I'll ride your faith. Because I really didn't have the faith to give all of that. I didn't have the confidence to give all of that. I just wanted to give some of it. So I'll ride your faith. And really what I was doing, it was the, the weak way out. Because if it all went bad, I could say, this was on you. So we gave all that money, gave it all to the Dream Center that day. We got back home. The lease ended. And we're still struggling, trying to find a place. They actually went under the bridge where we're doing our Friday night services for a while on Sunday mornings. And the whole time I'm thinking, see, I told you, I told you shouldn't have give all that money. We're trying to find something. Finally, we found this building. It was for sale. So I contacted the real estate agent. I said, hey, talk to the owner and see if he'd be willing to lease it to us. We just needed a place to lease. We were in a position to buy. It was a 10,000 square foot warehouse building, downtown Houston. And so the real estate agent told the owner, there was a church wanting to put a church in this building. He said, I want to meet with those preachers. So we went to this meeting, and it's me and Eugene and our attorney and the owner's attorney and the owner, Earl Parker Jr., and he was just an old rough guy, couldn't speak a word without cussing, and uh, I mean, I, was, I heard things I'd never heard before, and, and we're in this meeting, and he says, so I hear you guys want to put a blankety-blank church in this building. Uh, well, sort of, yeah, not, not quite the way I would have described it, but yes, we want to put a church. Well, I don't really want to lease this thing. I want to sell it. You guys want to buy it? And in my head, I'm thinking... No, because Eugene gave all of our money away. But I didn't say that. I didn't say it. I said, no, we're not really in a position to, to, to buy right now. We just really like to lease it. And he said, well, I really don't want to lease it. Blankety, blank, blank, blank. And he said, I'll tell you what. He put his head down. He thought for a little while. He said, how about if I just give it to you? Boy, our jaws hit the ground. He said, that would be awesome. You guys, you want to put a church in here? I said, yes, sir. He said, if you're willing to put a church in, here's how I'll give it to you. He said, on one condition, you pay for the taxes over this last year. He looked at his attorney. His attorney looked at our attorney. His attorney looked at Eugene. Eugene looked at me. I looked at, back at Earl Parker Jr. And he says, don't tell me you can't afford to pay the taxes. And in my head, I'm thinking, no, because Eugene gave all the money away. <laughs> and I said, no, we really don't. We don't have, no, we can't afford to do that either. Again, cussing spree. Blankety blank blank. Well, I'll just pay the taxes and give you the bill and just take the bill and just put a good church in here. And that's exactly what we did. Let me tell you something. Sometimes when you don't have the confidence to climb the mountain, you need to link up with somebody who does. You just need to ride somebody else's faith. And that's what Caleb shows us. Caleb had confidence. And Caleb said, you know what? I had a promise from God when I was 40 years of age, and here I am, 85 years old, and I've still got the confidence to take this mountain. So Joshua, give me this land. I want to climb that mountain. I'll drive those giants out of there. Look at the next verse, verse number 11. Here's Joshua. He says, I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. So the first lesson to take your mountain is to keep your confidence in God. The second is to stay strong in the Lord. Stay strong in the Lord. Caleb's confidence never wavered and his strength never failed. Now, many people may feel inadequate to face the mountains of life. Maybe you don't feel prepared. You don't feel like you are qualified or you don't feel like you're strong enough. Here's Caleb. Caleb had been through the difficult days. And I want you to listen to me carefully here. Caleb had been through the difficult days of the wilderness for 40 years. And going through tough times, going through difficult times can do one of two things to you. And it's all based on your attitude. 
If you get bitter because of the bad times, the difficult times, the desert experience, you will never be in a position to take your mountain. But if you will stay grateful and you will stay thankful and you will continue to find reason to give thanks to God, you will come out of this storm. You'll come out of your desert experience. You'll come out of this hard time stronger than when you went in. Caleb is standing stronger at 85 or as strong at 85 as he was when he was 40 because he didn't give in to a victim mentality while he was in the wilderness. He didn't get mad at God. He didn't give up on God. He didn't walk out on God. Now, listen, what I know is that some of you have faced some challenges. The enemy has come against you and tried to attack you, and you've withstood those challenges. You've overcome those storms, and when the devil tries to tempt you with those same things again, you just kind of look at him like, oh, you again? Because you've already been there. You've done that. You've won that battle. Some of you have been lied about. Others have lied about you, and you're still standing, and you're stronger today because lies couldn't take you down. Some of you, you face cancer and sickness and disease, and that couldn't stop you. You're still standing. Some of you face financial devastation. You're still standing. That couldn't stop you. Some of you, your very life has been threatened. The threat of death couldn't stop you. You're still standing. Some of you face mental and emotional and physical challenges. You're still standing. That couldn't stop you. I want you to know that no matter what has come against you, if you will keep a good attitude, a grateful attitude. You'll be stronger after the storm and the storm will have no power over you. Now, listen, sometimes when we start thinking of taking mountains, you've got to understand that being on a mountaintop has its challenges. Every tree that tries to grow on the mountaintop has a challenge because the the soil is usually pretty rocky. There's like a slab of granite, maybe two feet deep. So it's very difficult to grow deep roots. It's easier to grow shallow roots. And that's what most trees end up doing on the top of mountains. They take the easy way and they grow a shallow root system. And I think how very much like that we are, because what happens is it's very tempting to put down a shallow root system. And what happens is when the storm comes, your prayers don't get answered. Things don't turn out the way you wanted them to. You get a little angry at God and you have a shallow root system and the storm blows you away. Life brings you challenges. You face that challenge and you don't have a deep root system. That challenge will blow you away. Maybe you've put your trust in somebody and somebody's let you down and you had more faith in them than you had in God. That's a shallow root system and the storm comes and it blows you away. But when you're rooted and you're grounded, the winds can blow and the storms can rage and the rain can fall and you'll still be standing after the storm is done. You got to keep strong in the Lord. You've got to keep trusting in him. Now, listen, many people they try to find convenient and comfort and enjoyment in life, thinking that that's really the goal. That's a shallow root system. The way of shallow roots is when I choose an, the easy path rather than doing what's hard and doing what's right. You see, what happens is sometimes nobody knows you're not living the way you should, but you. But when the storm comes, you don't have the roots down deep to keep you standing. You see, trees can't wait until the storm comes to put deep roots down. You've got to put deep roots down so that when the storm comes, you'll still be standing. How do you put deep roots down? The best way is in the house of God. Psalms 92, 13 says, planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of God. Planted in the house of God. In fact, I'm going to say, when we're finished with Joshua, with this brave sermon series, I'll finish in the first part of August, a couple of weeks, just a few weeks left. We're going to get into the book of Acts because you know what Acts is? Acts is, it answers the question, why the church? Why do we do this thing called church? Why are we here? Why do we gather each Sunday? Why are we part of this thing called a church? And Acts answers that. And maybe you're wondering, why, why do we do this? Why do we come here every Sunday? 
You know why? Because the church is a family, not an event. And the people that make the mistake about the church is they think that I'm going to church like it's an event. No, church is something we are a part of. This is the way we do life. And Acts shows us the way we do life. I'm going to be talking about that as we get in probably second, third week of, of August. We'll get into that. But here's, here's the last part of this. Let me close this. Joshua 14, 13 says, Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron, that mountain area, as his inheritance. So you got to keep your confidence. You got to stay strong in the Lord. And then number three, you got to remember God never forgets. If God gave you a promise, he never forgets. We may forget, but God never forgets. God gave this land to Caleb as an inheritance, meaning it wasn't just for him. You know who else it was for? It was for his children. It was for his grandchildren. And because of his willingness to tackle this tough territory, Caleb had enough for himself, but he also had enough for his children and his grandchildren. So the benefits of the mountain climbing, it poured over into the lives of others. What I want you to realize is that your efforts, your determination, your fight, your crawl, your grit, everything you're doing to climb your mountain will have an effect on people all in your life. It'll have effect on your children. It'll have effect on your grandchildren. Let me close with this. How many have ever seen the reality show, The Amazing Race? Yeah, The Amazing Race. Okay, so people are coupled up with somebody else, maybe a friend, a brother, a father, a son, husband and wife, and they have all these challenges. They literally travel around the world. They're going around the world from station to station, accomplishing a goal, finding a clue, and completing the task. And once they get to one, uh, let's say at the end of one station, one, one uh, leg of the race, then let's say it's a husband and wife. They get there and they win. Well, they have a moment to celebrate, but they don't have really real long to celebrate because the race isn't over. It's made up of many different stations. Now you got to go on to the next. And maybe you get to the next one and maybe you don't win the next one. Maybe you come in second or third or fourth. Well, what? You don't really have time to sit around and complain. Why? Because the race isn't over. You got to get going to the next leg of the race and you got to keep going. And that's the way it is in life. And many of us, we've seen, if you've seen those, uh, those type of reality shows, people that argue and fight and complain, they end up just kind of disqualifying themselves out of the race because of the fighting and quarreling. There's no time to fight because there's still a mountain to climb. There's no time to celebrate and there's no time to rest because there's a mountain to climb. So you can't give up and you can't quit. And here's the way that relates to us in life. Sometimes you have a good day. Sometimes you have a good week. Sometimes you have a good year. Well, praise the Lord. But you know what? There's still another day ahead of us. There's still another week ahead of us. There's still another year ahead of us. So celebrate for a moment, but come on, let's get going. But maybe you had a bad week. Maybe you had a bad day. Maybe you had a bad year. Well, you know what? Maybe you did. Let's shake the dust off and let's get going because there's another day ahead of you. There's another week ahead of you. There's another year ahead of you. We do this every single week here at Freedom. We'll gather tomorrow morning at staff meeting and we'll talk about the successes and the wins of today. But then we got to put it behind us because you know what? July 28th is coming. There's another Sunday and we got to prepare for another Sunday and we got to get it ready for another win. And that's the way it is in life. We have challenges, we have difficulties, we have things that we all face, but we don't really have time to celebrate too long. And we certainly don't have time to complain because there's a race to win. There's a mountain to climb. There's something to accomplish. Now here's what happens. Many people end up living their life backwards. Here's how we live our life backwards. We're 18 years of age, don't really have a lot of money, don't have anybody really dependent on you. So you can get out there and you do whatever you want. You can take a big risk. You don't have a lot to lose. So you say, I'm going to do something radical for the Lord. I'm going to really go for it. I'm going to climb my mountain. But then things start changing. You get married. If you're a guy, you take on a wife and now you've got a wife who's dependent upon you. You get a job. Now you've got a boss that's depending on you. A few years later, you're going to have a child, and now you've got a kid that's depending on you. Maybe another kid, another, and like me, they just keep on coming. It's just 
then grandkids and so many you can't count. But things start changing. You start getting a little older. And as you get a little older, now you've got a little more to lose. You got people that are dependent on you, so you don't take quite as many risks. You start playing life a little bit safer. That's not what Caleb did. Caleb didn't get to 85 years of age and say, yeah, those giants, they didn't look too tough when I was 40, but I got a lot to lose now. I'm not the young whippersnapper that I was back when I was 40, so I tell you, I'll let somebody else take this mountain. That's not what Caleb did. Caleb said, I can take that mountain today just like I could have yesterday. God promised that mountain to me, and so I'm going to take it. And I'll kick the giants off the mountain if they're in my way. Here's what I'm, I'm, I'm believing. Here's what I, I believe that God is calling us in this season, in this moment, to take your mountain. What is it? I don't know what it is for you. But there's something that God wants you to accomplish and wants you to go for and wants you to take on. And you've got to find the confidence and you've got to find the strength and you've got to hold on to the promise of God and say, you know what? I can do this. Because God's going to give me the strength to do it. I'm strong enough today. I don't want to play it safe. Here's what I'll happily ever after for me is when I stand before God in heaven and I stand there with my wife and I stand there with my kids and I stand there with my grandkids and I can say, didn't I tell you it was worth it? I told you it was worth it being in church every Sunday. I told you that it was worth it every sacrifice that we made. I told you that it was worth it because we didn't go the way of the world and we chose to do it Jesus' way. I told you it was worth it. That's what happily ever after is for me. But many people will not experience that because they start this slow, gradual decline of just playing it safe and taking the easy way. And what happens is you build a shallow root system. And the storm comes and blows you away. I'm saying don't be blown away. Develop deep roots. Roots in the family of God. Roots in the house of God. Roots in the promises of God. And when the storm comes, you will still be standing. Can somebody say amen? Come on, do me a favor. Stand to your feet all over this place. As you stand, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads just a moment. While you bow your heads, let me tell you about somebody else who climbed a mountain. His name was Jesus. He climbed a mountain called Calvary. Mount Calvary. He climbed that mountain for you. He climbed that mountain to carry your sins to the cross, my sins to the cross. He carried our sins so that we wouldn't be under the penalty of death anymore. God has something amazing that he wants you to do. A mountain he wants you to climb. A dream to fulfill. A goal to accomplish. But you'll never do it apart from Jesus. He's the one who put the dream in your heart. He's the one that gives you the confidence and the strength that you need. He is the promise that you hold on to. If you're here today and you've never said yes to Jesus, or if you're here and you've wandered away from your faith, it's time to come back to Jesus. And I want to I pray with you. And I'm going to lead you in this simple prayer. I'm going to ask everyone to pray so no one prays alone. But if you're here today and you say, Pastor, include me in that prayer. You know things are not where they need to be with the Lord. You know you're not where you need to be, but you say, you know what? I'm ready to make it right today. On the count of three, would you slip up your hand so I know who I'm praying for? One, two, three. Say, that's me. That's me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. I see you, brother. Thank you. Yes. I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Hands all over this room. I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. And everyone prays so no one prays alone. Say, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me. Come into my heart, wash away my sin, and be the Lord of my life today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.